Thanks very much. Thanks uh, to the Getty and, for, and to Natasha and everyone for organizing this. It's been really, really fun to listen to everybody's lectures. Um, so happy to be here. So the Schindler House was uh, built in 1922 by the Schindlers. And the title of my talk is Taking Cues from the Schindlers because that's really where, that's really our jumping off point at, at the Mac Center. Um, we also don't really define ourselves as a house museum. There's a little bit of the original furniture uh, in the house, and we bring it in every now and then um, to, you know, to sort of reset it up for a photo shoot. But, but in general, uh, the, the sort of mission of the Mac Center, which has been there since the mid-90s, has been to activate Schindler's architecture through contemporary engagement and to really take his experimental nature um, as a really important um, thing to never, never forget about. We always kind of keep that at the, at the beginning, at the front of our brains. Uh, because Schindler was somebody who was absolutely radical for his time, and he was never afraid to try something new. If you look at his work, every decade looks completely different from the decade before. Um, and that's something that, that, that we really find important. Um, and he married Pauline Schindler, um, in Chicago when he was there. He, he initially went to, to um, work in Chicago for Frank Lloyd Wright after he left Vienna. Um, and that's actually what got him out here to, to Los Angeles. Um, like Jeffrey said earlier, he actually worked on the Barnstall project for quite a while. So he came out here and Pauline came out here too. Um, and and one of, I'm gonna read this quote from Pauline Schindler. Uh, it, was a, it was something that she wrote to her mother. Um, and then it says, from this is from 1916. So like well before they actually got to LA and, and got to King's Road, which was 1920. Um, mother, one of my dreams is to have someday a little joy of a bungalow on the edge of the woods and mountains near a crowded city, which shall be open just as some people's hearts are open to friends of all classes and types. So. Pauline Schindler always had this idea in her mind that she didn't want just a regular house. She wanted a house which was going to redefine what the, what the nuclear family was and how that operated, which was going to redefine what public and private space, those, those divisions, became much less clear uh, in, in Pauline's vision. And so that, um, along with Schindler's vision of um, having, building a little house uh, with earth at the back and light at the front, something very almost primitive. It's really, it's really those two visions that came together and, and gave us the, the Schindler House. So this is the, this is the um, floor plan. And again, probably most of you are really familiar with it, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time, but it was essentially designed as a two-person or two-family house uh, to be shared uh, by two couples. So there was a, 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 a shared kitchen kind of in the middle, then two quarters for, for each of the families um, to live their lives. And interestingly, the, the, you won't see on this floor plan, you won't see a place that says living room um, or dining room. It's like the main rooms were studios for each of the four adults that lived in the house. So the idea was that these were all creative people. Creative people need a space to work. So that was gonna be where they did their work. And then the actual living happened outside. So the outdoor, you know, where you see here patio, patio, those are actually gardens uh, that were sort of defined by, the, by the, the architecture. And those were the places to hang out and to socialize and, um, and to sort of, you know, be free thinkers. Uh, so this is the, the house as it was going up. Um, it's a tilt slab concrete um, construction. Uh, it was very, easy to build in a way. It was just like a couple of guys um, that, that could put the whole thing together. <clears throat> and then these are just some of the, the, the images of the house over the, over the years. It was all very bohemian. It was very low. It was very much about like sitting on the floor and, and you know, doing artistic things. Um, this is, a, this is a, a kind of a famous image of Gilka Shire, who uh, was an art collector who moved uh, to the LA from Europe. Um, and she was a collector of the Blue Four, so she became um, kind of an important person here. But you know, very artistic, very loungy. This was, a, this was 1926 Thanksgiving um, out in the patio or the, you know, the, the, the Schindler side of the house, their living room, um, very typical scene. Um, and then this is also some, just some, some, a card of one of the things that was happening back then. Music, um, this, the, the, the picture over on the far right was a picture of some pe of the people that were staying in the guest apartment. Um, so it kind of gives you a feeling of like what the sort of social vibe was. So the house itself was not only a really important statement of Schindler's 
vision and his kind of a realization in a way of his, of his manifesto that he wrote when he was a, a student. But it was also became, because of Pauline Schindler more or less, a sort of center for the avant-garde in Los Angeles, really starting from the 20s and in some ways going really all the way through into the 50s. Now, Pauline and, Schindler, and, and Rudolph split up. Um, at a certain point, Sch Pauline left. Um, went and did some other things and then realized at a certain point, like, actually, this is half my house, too. So she moved back, and the house that had been kind of designed for two couples became the house for the divorced couple, and it worked out really well. Uh, they just built a little wall in between that node where the, where the two families had shared uh, space. Um, and Pauline lived on her side until she died in 1978, and uh, Rudolf Schindler lived on his side until he died in 1953. They, they communicated by mail after that. Uh, so this is a picture of the house today uh, from the front. I love this image of the house because it's like you can barely see that it's a house. I mean, it's sort of a little structure. Uh, at, at one time, very, very primitive, and at the other, at the same time, incredibly sophisticated, um, kind of in this in this garden. And of course, indoor outdoor living uh, was hugely important to the to the concept of of this house, and then and then in the rest of Schindler's work. Uh, so today, um, we do a lot there. Uh, the, the Max Center was established in 94 um, with, with doing programming out of the Schindler House, but also um, we own a couple of other Schindlers. One of them is the Mackey Apartment Building on Cochrane, and we run an artist and architect and residence program out of that. Um, and so, you know, it's really about trying to, we want to, we physically keep up the house and we work very closely uh, with, the, the, with the, the conservators of the house, um, which is the nonprofit Friends of the Schindler House. Uh, who took over the house after Pauline died. Um, but, but, but in order to keep it relevant, in order to keep it kind of that space that like it was always supposed to be in, in, in Schindler's, in the Schindler's mind, um, we, you know, we do, we do a lot of stuff here. This was the Stephen Hall lecture that we did a couple, a couple years ago. This was five minutes after like a massive downpour. This was one of those like amazing moments where like we have to do everything outside um, because there's not enough room. Um, but it, it sort of worked out for us. Um, this was a, a, a fashion show uh, framework that we did, um, and we had asked uh, Koa Pimmelblau, who had, who's a Viennese architect, but they were working in Los Angeles at the time doing, doing the school on Grand Avenue, and so they did the architecture for this fashion show for us, which um, was pretty ex amazing, and it was one of these situations where you could, the, the, the models could actually be up on the top of the stair um, and you could see those models from all over the site. So the, the audience was outside, inside the house was backstage, and then we had this, this very elaborate set of uh, runway systems. Um, and then the people who were actually you know, putting the work into the show were, were it was a very multidisciplinary crowd. It was um, a lot of architects and artists and musicians and also some fashion designers. Um, so here you see two, two different works by, um, different architects. On the left, it was um, Frank Escher and Ravi Gunavardina doing um, this kind of square meter uh, uh, kind of fashion um, concept. And then on the other side is uh, Elena Man Manfredini, also an architect, who did these like laser cut dresses. Uh, this, was a pro this was another installation that we did with open source architecture. This was a kind of a, um, an algorithmic variation of the Schindler House modularity put into, made into this kind of a structure and, and, and outside in one of the courtyards. Um, this was a show that was called the Gene Home Project. So we were kind of playing with the idea of genetically modifying the DNA of the Schindler House. This was also part of the, that show, which was a piece by Servo, which was kind of an interactive sound emitting radio signal flying um, installation. Also really beautiful. Um, Okay. Uh, this was a, a show we did a few years ago, um, curated by Sylvia Levin, um, as a part of the Getty, P, one of the Getty PSD uh, Pacific Standard Time initiatives. Um, this one was focusing on architecture, and, and this particular show called Everything Loose Will Land um, looked at the 70s and how, and the kind of cross-pollinization that was taking place between artists and architects during that time. So we had a Bruce Nauman piece um, back in the back Ivy Garden. We had um, a piece of this play, this like playground equipment designed by uh, Peter John Pierce. Uh, we had these blockses, which were which were made by Jeff Raskin back in the 70s, and they're still making them. And so we had those kind of set up. They're very very interactive. So like all of this stuff is all all the things that we do are 
they may not have anything to actually do with the Schindler House, but they always have to do with some kind of experimentation. And what's interesting is because the house itself is such an incredibly strong presence, it always ends up being in dialogue with whatever we put there, even if it's, you know, if it's intentional or not. And there's, there's a kind of a whole range of things we do, some things that really have nothing to do with the architecture and some things where the architecture is absolutely central. So I'm just showing you kind of a quick range. This was um, a sound installation that we did. Um, it worked with two different artists, one on each side of the house. It works really well to do two artists um, because of the, the two family you know, kind of system. It works out well that way. So on one side of the house, it was Andrea Frazier. Um, she did a sound installation called um, Tehachapi at King's Road. She essentially um, recorded the live sounds of the Tehachapi prison complex, um, a little bit north of here, and, 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 and inserted that into the Schindler House, which was just a crazy sensation um, to suddenly be in the house and see those slit windows and have the sounds of a prison. And then on the other side, um, it was Vanessa Place, who is a conceptual poet, and this was her last words piece, which is essentially very, very, very softly, uh, she had recorded the last statements of everybody, every inmate on death row in Texas. So it was a very like intense show that had nothing to do with Schindler, but somehow the architecture could be reread in, in the context of these artworks. Um, and again, it's all about like giving curators, giving artists, giving architects a platform to really try something new. That's really what we care about. And so the last two projects I'm going to focus on a little bit more. I actually have video. I'm going to bring a little bit of real time uh, into the talk. Um, the first one is called Pauline the Opera. These last two pieces are actually performance pieces. I think it was interesting the question that came up earlier. like. Do you do, like, how do you decide between installations and performances? And I think one of the things that, I mean, we love it all. We try everything. We, we have a really active calendar, so we try lots of stuff. But, but, but the last few years, we've done some performances, which I have found particularly successful at the Schindler House. And both of them use the house as a, as a very important departure point. One is, is historical. This was, um, this was a, a project. Um, again, but done by architects uh, Frank Escher, Ravi Gunavardina, who, who basically designed an opera around the history of Pauline and Rudolph's relationship, um, starting from when they met at a concert in Chicago and then moving into like sort of their whole life together. Um, and so, and, and it was amazing because they, they, they did everything from letters. Um, they ended up translating some stuff from old German that, that like that nobody had ever translated before, so there was a lot of new knowledge actually created from making this artwork. Um, and it just became like an incredible way to interpret the history of the house. Um, so I'm gonna play you one clip here that um, essentially, it's, it's during this phase where I had mentioned that Rudolph and Pauline split up and they were writing letters to each other and they were kind of like bickering about various things, um, including Pauline running over Rudolph's dog accidentally. Um, <laughs> Etc. Her painting, her part of the house, pink, which you know he wasn't too thrilled with, um, and so and so. But it sort of, but it, but it gives you that sense. And I think one of the things I love about this project is that you'll see people kind of looking at their programs. The entire program was like just footnote after footnote because the entire libretto is only made from letters. You know between. John Cage and Pauline, who had a, had a relationship, and John Cage was living at the house for a while between Rudolph and Pauline, between Pauline and, and Rudolph's mother. And so, and so it, was, it was really scholarly, but at the same time, um, it, was, it was an opera, full on. People laughed, people cried, it had an incredible arc, and all the music that was, um, that was, that was played in it all had some kind of historical relevance to the topic. So f for example, the, for the John Cage part, you know, they played a John Cage piece that he you know, may have you know, composed near that time. Um, Henry Cowell was kind of part of the Schindler's circle, so there's a point where they're playing Henry Cowell music, et cetera. So it was kind of, this is how the, the two architects who are also really invested in music put this together. So I'm gonna see if I can um, make this work. <laughs> Nineteen forty nine, Pauline returns permanently to King's Road. Madam, I hear you want me to select a color for the painting of King's Road. You understand that King's Road was built 
as a protest against the American habit of covering their life and their buildings with coats of finished material to fool the onlooker about the commonplace base. King's Road was conceived as a combination of honest materials, concrete, redwood, glass, which were to be left to show the inner structure and their natural color. The house is the first example of the type of modern dwelling which is now repeated endlessly, endlessly, and as such has some historical interest. I realize that you have fought from the beginning against the character and the essence of the house, and the painting of the outside aged redwood in a contrasting color would be the final stab in the back. <laughs> if you paint your part of the house, and I wish you would restrict yourself to that, my struggle for her expression and the resistance of the insensitivity would receive another monument. I offered to share the hospital cost for Prince's accident, not because I was in any way responsible for it, but simply because I was so very sorry. This was upon an ethical, not legalistic basis. I'm sorry, but you've misunderstood me. Being sorry is a good way of chloroforming your guilt feeling but it cannot replace an adult acceptance of responsibility for your actions. After running down somebody with your car, the least you can do is to pay the doctor. Ask anybody with some sense of decency. Please try to understand your dog, Prince, was lying at the far edge of the driveway as I slowly backed out. He was by the hedge, invisible to me. I had no knowledge of his but deafness. This was, this was one of those amazing concerts, and it only happened once, and we'd like to happen it again, but it was, again, a really, for us, a really interesting way to actually interpret the, um, interpret the house. And you can actually see the whole thing, which was an hour long, um, on uh, this online publication that we did. It was part of a, a project called Schindler Lab. So if you go to schindlerlab.org, you can actually hear the whole thing in, you know, in sync and, and, and in stereo. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the next project, um, which we just did. This was just last month. Um, it's a project called Modern Living. Uh, it's something that has, we, d we were in development with this project for like the last three years. Um, I had invited uh, these two artists, Ryan Kelly and Brennan Gerard, to um, work together with us and the Glass House. Um, I know we have a Glass House representative here today, so I want to plug that because that part's coming up. Um, but, but we asked them to come up with a, a, a dance project uh, for the house. They're both dancers and choreographers. Um, and they're, they're interesting because they're a couple. They also um, do work around the couple and thought that, and so we thought it would be a really interesting idea to um, have them do something, to commission them something for the two houses, because of course, coupleness and the couple is very, you know, is very prominent in in our house, both physically and and kind of socially, and the glass house as well. I mean, Philip Johnson was a really was part of a couple, was very very prominent, and the glass house itself really doesn't exist without the brick house. There's a kind of duality that's sort of built into that site as well, um, and so they took the challenge on and worked with it for quite a while, um, and then and we engaged LA Dance Project um, to be a partner with us, and so they were, um, they sort of provided the dancers who were very collaborative in the whole thing. Um, and uh, we, so, so we staged our version of it uh, in, in the middle of January, um, and we just essentially opened up the house um, for the weekend, and it was structured so that like every hour, the it would be like a loop, the performance would start again. 
Um, and so we kind of ticketed it. Two, it sold out really fast. I mean, it was two, free, but, but we wanted to two, limit the number of people men. that could find it at any moment. Women. So it was kind of like, you know, they, they would come in at 1 o'clock, and, and, and then they would just kind of have to wander women. around the house. Two you could never really men. see the whole and thing unless you sort of women. stayed all weekend long. Um, and, um, and but, but it had, it had a strong, that strong two sense of houseness on one level because women. there were things, there was a lot of counting off. There was a lot of, of like, kind of language about like the daily two. activities of living. Um, it was a kind of like, you know, sense of one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, the kind of like time that gets kind of played out. Um, as in any house, you don't necessarily know what's going on everywhere. There wasn't that kind of like overview. Uh, in this case, they all kind of left the house toward the end of the performance and, and, and were out in the front yard and, and it would kind of culminate there. Um, but there was, and then there was this kind of like Queer, we were sort of queering the house at this point too, because um, we were thinking a lot about couples and like you know like heterosexual couples and gay couples and what and like you know exploding the idea of like closed marriages, um, which all sort of relates to both sides essentially. And so, um, so I'm going to show you two clips. Um, one of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, and they, they, they actually also used a lot of song and, and, and language uh, in, in the dance, and, and I think it was really, really beautiful. Everything it was totally changes. packed. We had to add a show, um, but I think that it was, it you made me feel like, wow, no performance soul. works so you well. That was part no of the reason why I, I wanted to show these, spend a little bit more time on these today, because I think that that kind of way of working could actually apply to pretty much any happy. house, even if it's a, even if it's more of a, a traditional house you museum. There's something the about blues. just letting the house be a character character in a performance you that, that I think works really rolls. well. So you eat jelly um, rolls. We can make this Charter one. Is one way. You take the high road in your big wheel. Eight steps you fly, eight steps you fly. Look at the view. Right to horizon, talk to the sky, act like you talk, act like you talk, work like the sun, shine in your heaven, see what you've done. Come down and walk, come down and walk, sit, you sit down, breathe when you breathe, lie down, you lie down, walk where you walk, walk where you walk, talk when you talk. Cry when you cry, lie down, you lie down, die when you die, die when you die, die when you die, die when you die, die when you die.
Okay, it's a little bit longer than that, but I'm going to I'm going to cut it um, and and in, and encourage any of you that happen to be in the East Coast um, in the New Canaan area, um, May 13th and 14th. This whole thing is going to be staged at the Glass House. Then and I'm really curious to see how that works out because it's a completely different kind of site. Um, and this one was was really really very much worked out uh, with the Schindler House kind of in mind. So I'm and it's the same dancers. Um, so I think it's actually gonna be really beautiful. And, and this just gave you the tiniest snippet. I wish everybody could have been there. It was really completely moving um, and, and, and a really interesting way to think about both architecture and the couple. So um, that's all I'm gonna tell you right now. Thank you very much.